Hello, and welcome to the AWS Research Seminar Series. I'm Erica Cox, Program Manager for the Higher Education Research Team here at AWS, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Adam Kiefer and Ryan McPherson, who will discuss the development of a cloud-enabled computer vision platform for the automated assessment of basketball shooting performance. Dr. Adam Kiefer is the co-director of the Simulation, Training, Analytics, and Rehabilitation, or STAR, Heal Performance Laboratory, and assistant professor at the Department of Exercise and Sports Science in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is also the co-founder and chief executive officer of Ellipsis LLC. He has 17 years experience in human performance science, data modeling, and technology development, with over 60 peer-reviewed articles, two patents, and 6.5 million in grant and industry funding. We are also joined by Ryan McPherson, who is the Director of Technical Development at the Star Heal Performance Laboratory with the Department of Exercise and Sports Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He has over 10 years of experience in mobile and spatial computing applications for human performance with expertise in eye tracking data visualization, and machine learning. He is the lead software developer on over 10 industry, federal, and military funding projects. He is also the co-founder and chief technology officer of Ellipsis LLC. We will reserve the last five to 10 minutes of this session for questions and answers, so feel free to place any questions that you may have during the presentation in the questions queue in the GoToWebinar toolbar and I'll be happy to read them aloud at the end of the session. At this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Kiefer. Thank you, Erica, um, and thank you all for being here. We're excited to share um, how we have leveraged um, the AWS services to um, accelerate our technology development for our automated assessment basketball shooting platform. Um, and I'm gonna start uh, by talking through a little bit about our environment and, and how we came to address this problem. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan and he's gonna talk more about sort of the, the technical development and implementation of, of the AWS services that helped us um, get to the, the platform that we have today. So as Erica mentioned, we both work in the Star Heal Performance Laboratory. Um, and I just want to share a little bit about our mission because I think it frames um, the work that we do in more of an applied sort of out of the lab sort of environment. So what we really try to do is we conduct research in, in theoretic, using theoretical frameworks and, and basic research designs to innovate real world applications uh, where we're trying to combine behavioral and movement science, immersive technologies and AI to improve health and performance outcomes. And really what we wanna do is we wanna disrupt how we get the science out to the athletes or the performers who need it. Now, being an academic research lab, we do have um, some limitations. Uh, so our environment is very lean. Um, we have small budgets. We're constantly dealing with um, ways, obviously, to get funding um, to develop technologies to conduct our research. Um, these budgets are fluctuating, particularly um, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, we've had a lot of fluctuations over the last couple of years, and they can really limit what we're able to do. We're also at a public university, so state dollars are fluctuating um, due to government decisions on state budgets and things like that. Um, what this means is because we're a lean academic research environment, we have a limited number of full-time staff and students. Um, our full-time staff is actually limited to Ryan. Uh, he is the Assistant Director of Technical Development. And then we have students that work um, alongside him and sort of under both Ryan and I that we're having to onboard quickly, get up to speed quickly, and allow them to pursue uh, research projects or technology development projects um, that fall within sort of the scope of Star Heal. What this also means is we have a high turnover of personnel, um, particularly when we're bringing on undergraduate research assistants. Um, oftentimes we'll go out and we'll recruit from other classes to try to bring in undergraduate research assistants. And these are students who could be in exercise science, they could be in psychology, um, neuroscience, they might be in computer science. It's a diverse set of skills. And particularly with the students that are not in the more, I would say, technical heavy uh, disciplines, they're coming in with very limited skill sets as it pertains to coding, 
um, machine learning, model building, et cetera. And we need to onboard them quickly because we usually only have them for about a semester and only about 10 hours a week. So we don't have a lot of time um, to get them up and running and uh, contributing to the mission of the lab and gaining the skills that they want so that they can move on um, with their own personal and professional goals. What often um, happens then because of this whole sort of environment is that we end up with very bespoke solutions. These are solutions that are very project specific, which makes them inefficient for deploying across multiple projects. Uh, generally, you'll have code that only one person really understands. It may work, it may not work. And the minute we upgrade hardware, um, you know, wearables, things that are bringing data in, um, the code is now broken. And if we want to scale to larger um, projects or we want to you know go after federal research funding let's say to pursue a particular research question we start over from scratch and we're losing time maybe six nine months to a year in developing the the platform that we need to execute the research that we're trying to um, examine so these are all sort of limitations and um, things that have um, that we've had to deal with as we've moved forward with a lot of our work now I want to kind of dive into the actual problem at hand that drove the development of the solution that Ryan will be talking about. So here I want you to take a look at these two shot charts. Um, these are um, examples of challenges that players face, and this is from a particular NBA player. So on the left, you can see um, we have a player who over the first 11 games shot 51.3% uh, from the field. And the green areas on the shot chart denote zones that are above league average. So this um, particular player was shooting above um, the average for the league for his position in those different areas. Um, but what will happen is inevitably all players are going to fall into a shooting slump. And that's exactly what happened to the same player over the next four games. So you can see the change from those green zones where the player was shooting above average to red. And what happens is um, when this happens, the player is bombarded with information. Um, the spotlight goes on the player, both from a fan perspective, but also from a coach and support staff perspective and from um, his or her teammates. And they're bombarded with information. They're given all kinds of data. Um, everybody has an opinion on how to fix the shot. And what ends up happening is the player generally will just go into an empty gym and just try to shoot their way out of it by taking hundreds, if not thousands of, of jump shots, trying to find their rhythm again, while trying to deal with sort of the physical and mental aspects uh, and stressors that come along with um, shooting in a slump. But we know there's a better way to do this, and, and that's something that we wanted to focus on. And, and one thing we really wanted to focus on was, is there, are there modifiable characteristics that we can help the athlete target precisely and in a personalized way to help them get back to the, the performance um, that they know they're capable of. And one area that we've explored is eye tracking. So if you look at these two um, images, uh, what we see here is a basket and then a heat map. And what the heat map is showing is sort of the, the dominant focal point of the athlete's gaze. And here, the gaze patterns of two different NBA players, professional basketball players, um, during 30 free throws. And if I asked you, who do you think is the better shooter, just from looking at these two images, most of you would probably easily say, well, it's the one on the left. And you would be right. In fact, the one on the left that has a much more focused um, area of visual attention during the free throw shot shoots 88% from the free throw line and the athlete on the left shoots 55%, and their focus is much more variable and inconsistent. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to understand how can we really digitally transform training with a way to um, investigate this new frontier in understanding what an athlete is seeing and thinking, particularly during basketball shooting. Now we know um, that bigger, stronger, faster is sort of a mentality in athletics. But what happens is as athletes become more professionalized and more elite, those physical capabilities become less and less. This means that the development of expertise in sports requires moving beyond that bigger, stronger, fa faster focus um, on the physical dom domains and moving to a new frontier of performance enhancement um, focused on the psychological, emotional, and perceptual cognitive behaviors. 
unfortunately, these this new frontier of behaviors is not as easy to measure and index as these physical attributes. If I bring an athlete in and I have them lift a weight, I can see pretty quickly how much weight they can lift. I can look at their max jump height. I can time them to see how fast they can make it down the court. But if I wanna know what the athlete is seeing, how they're processing that information and what they're thinking, it's much harder to get into and oftentimes pretty nebulous. And so we wanted to try to identify some new performance indicators that can be used um, to as sort of markers for this sort of perceptual cognitive performance that can augment these bigger, stronger, faster variables. And ultimately the question came down to how do we get athletes the right results at the right time with maximum efficiency? Because the other issue is you don't wanna measure something on an athlete and they have to wait several days to a week before you get the feedback results so that they can integrate it into their training. And in fact, historically, that's what's happened with eye tracking. And one of the reasons it hasn't taken off is because you need somebody to hand code frame by frame. So you have a video frame of what the athlete's seeing and you see the eye gaze of what an athlete is seeing. And then somebody has to go in and actually hand code the time points where different behaviors are changing during, for example, the shooting motion. And if you have a single athlete take 30 free throws, this could take hours or even a day before you can turn that, that, turn that around into a report with actionable information. So our solution for all of this was an automated, what we call vision in action, quiet eye assessment. Quiet eye is the last good look an athlete gets before they perform a given task. And in this case, it's the last sort of quieting of gaze into a focal point and how long they can maintain that focal point as they begin to shoot and ultimately release the ball to uh, shoot a free throw. So I'm gonna turn over um, the presentation to Ryan now and he's gonna talk through the development of automating this vision in action quiet eye assessment platform. Thanks Adam. So what I want to talk about today is a combination of some of the hardware that we're using to actually capture this data and then also how we've gone through and implemented every step in AWS. So what I want to start with is what we actually use as our portable assessment tools. As Adam said, it's very important for us to actually bring our uh, data collection technology into the context in which the athlete is going to be performing. Traditional biomechanics and, and sports research may take you out of that context, and that could, to varying degrees, affect the performance that we're actually able to measure and then intervene on. So our primary tool is the Toby Pro Glasses 3. This is a head-mounted eye tracking device. You can see on the left-hand side there that it incorporates a um, forward-facing scene camera. It incorporates multiple uh, eye perspective cameras and infrared sensors in order to look at the visual field that the athlete is able to perceive, but then also, as you'll see in a moment, it can project down to a focal point that we can then say the athlete is actually attending to at a particular point in time. It also includes a couple other sensor streams like a, a full IMU, so we can get acceleration and orientation data, um, and will also allow us to record anywhere between uh, 50 to 100 hertz. In addition to that, what we want to do is we want to be able to contextualize what the gauge data is doing within the context of the physical performance of the athlete. So in order to do that, we use an external scene camera. Any USB web camera will do. Recently, we have come to the Logitech Brio because it allows us to uh, go anywhere up to 4K resolution and anywhere between 30 and 90 frames per second. So if we combine both of those assessment tools together, what we're actually trying to look at is we're trying to look at concurrently a first person perspective of the shot as it's being undertaken and then a sagittal or um, sideways view of the athlete's body so that we can see um, what they're doing as they're actually performing the shot as well as also track the ball trajectory from multiple pers perspectives. So I'm going to touch on how we actually get to the end result in a moment, but I want to show you what the end result should look like first so we can um, have a, a shared understanding of what we're trying to go for here. So this is um, actual performance data on a fake athlete. And you can see on the left-hand side, we have some basic demographic forms. As we come to the middle shot-by-shot -shot quiet eye duration score, 
Uh, if you look at time zero, you can consider that that's the release of the ball. So anything uh, negative is pre-release of the ball. Anything positive is post-release of the ball. And then you can see that Carolina blue is make and gray is misses. So um, what you're able to do on a shot-by-shot -shot basis is determine this quiet eye duration and score and then correlate that with their actual performance makes versus misses. And we have um, on the further right-hand side, we have representative shots. These are not aggregates, these are individual shots um, where you can see a heat map of their performance for that particular shot. In this context, uh, more red tightly clustered together indicates that that particular area of the, the scene camera is being attended to for longer and has more samples there. Um, so you can intuit pretty readily that the, the top view with the make where there's a lot more red tightly clustered on the hoop is going to be more beneficial than um, a loosely clustered green setup that you see down in the miss view there. And then on the bottom, uh, what we wanna be able to provide is we wanna take all of the, these metrics and distill them down into something that is actionable and interpretable for an athlete or a coach. So we tend to boil that down to two, maybe three action items, two bullet points that we can provide um, for them to actually utilize and intervene on. The idea is we wanna keep this uh, as low tech as possible. So we have a high tech uh, tracking and analysis solution, but a low tech implementation that we can give them um, a couple different points or drills or techniques to try to uh, address whatever inefficiencies we might see from the system. So how do we get to this point? How do we actually develop this? So we have the eye tracker, we have an external camera view, and next what I wanna talk through is actually deriving scene context from uh, two uh, video perspectives at the same time. So we have a local system, I'm gonna play this through. It's gonna just be three shots that are just going to repeat, and you'll see as we add in new um, context that we're pulling in. So the um, left side is the first person camera display. The right side is a sagittal outside view. Uh, they are both from the same shot. They are uh, synchronized at the same time. We're gonna focus on just the gaze side on the left for right now. So um, you have obviously the perspective of the athlete, but then what we're able to do is we can take the vector of the eye tracking data um, and we will add in, in a moment here, a gaze reticle. There you go. So we have a green circle that will show you um, exactly where the athlete's looking at a particular point in time in the video feed. And if we're doing this by hand as is traditionally done, this is basically the extent of the, the data that you are going to be able to derive from the first person perspective. So an individual person will take a, a week or so to actually go through and record everything. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take our um, recognition, uh, AWS recognition models, and we can apply them to the scene camera. And here you can see we're tracking the position of the ball, tracking the position of the rim, the net, and the backboard. And then from there, it becomes trivial, you can see in the top left corner there, for us to put a marker or a flag whenever they're looking where we want them to look, which in this case is the rim. So as they go through and they do their shots, you can see right there that it will tell you the moments where they're fixated on a particular object. Now their gaze behavior is important, but we want to be able to contextualize that to what the actual phase of the shot that they're in. Um, from there, we use the external camera view in order for us to determine the release points of the ball in order to determine their kinematics and that sort of thing. So we build off of AWS recognition again, we get the same classes that we do from the external view, so we, or the, the first person view. So we get the ball, we get the net, we get the rim, we get the backboard. Uh, from there, we're able to um, track the flight of the ball. We're able to determine when the ball is in the vicinity of the rim. We add onto that a third party pose estimation solution that allows us to get the kinematics of the athlete. These are joint angles, hip, knee, elbow, um, that allow us to know what phase of the shot that they are in and determine the release point of the ball. Once the ball is actually released, we then go through another phase of detection using, again, AWS recognition to determine whether the ball is actually inside the net or not. You'll see a little green check mark pop up in the left there. And that helps us determine whether it is a make or a miss. So we combine all of these understanding models to um, 
produce basically a time series of data that we can then convert into a human understandable report. That's the last should go there. Yep. So what I just described is essentially three analysis verticals. The first vertical we have is the actual gauge performance itself. So the quiet eye performance in a vacuum, not related to any of their kinematics. Uh, so from here, we take the Toby gaze data, we combine it with a trained bounding box recognition model from AWS using our data, and we combine that with um, some proprietary heuristics in order to get our measures of gaze performance. So these are going to be the uh, onset, duration, and end of any individual fixations, as well as placing the gaze point inside of any of those bounding boxes to know which portion of the scene they're looking at, any objects of interest that they're looking at. On top of that, we have our make-miss model, which allows us to automatically detect whether um, the shot was successful or not. This is built actually on two AWS recognition models. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, we have bounding boxes, again, from the external view to allow us to track the ball relative to the position of the rim. And then we also use an, an in or out classifier to let us know whether the ball is inside or outside of the net at a particular given time. And then we take that time series data with some proprietary heuristics and determine whether the shot was actually a make or a miss. This allows us to then correlate, of course, gaze performance with the successful outcome of the shot. And then finally, what we do is in order to contextualize um, the last good look, as Adam described it, uh, prior to release of the ball, we actually need to know what phase of the shot they're in. So again, we rely on uh, recognition and bounding boxes combined with a third-party pose estimation solution, uh, custom heuristics, and then we're able to divide the shot into uh, multiple movement phases that allow us to know if they're about to shoot, if they're collecting themselves ready to go, or if they're already post-release. And we'll take a look at some of all of that in a um, little bit more detail in a moment. What I want to first do is I want to introduce those who are not aware of AWS recognition to um, how recognition works and how we've utilized it in this context, because it is a um, tremendous service that I think has really accelerated our ability to perform um, both with this particular task and other tasks in our lab. So our pipeline's relatively simple for AWS um, recognition training. We take all of our video data from any perspective, um, exterior or first person. We load it up to uh, Amazon's S3 bucket uh, cloud or cloud storage solution. And then we utilize extensively uh, Amazon SageMaker's Mechanical Turk and Ground Truth service. Um, Ground Truth, which I'll go into in a minute, allows us to annotate the um, images, draw bounding boxes, do in and or out classification, either by assigning that to a student or utilizing the Mechanical Turk ser service where we can send that out to a number of contractors that we specify and within as little as three to six hours have results come back for us. And then Amazon Recognition is a computer vision based service that allows you to take an image or a video and either have that um, be analyzed by the pre-existing recognition models. These will be things for relatively general classes of objects like determining whether a person is in scene or whether there's a car or labeling the concept of basketball in our video, that it's a basketball video. They also offer a service that we utilize here called Custom Labels, which allows us to um, upload all of our data, label it, and then train a model entirely in AWS uh, where either myself or a student doesn't need to specify um, any of the parameters of training or select any of the models, but really focus on the management and annotation of data and come back and still get high quality results that we can then utilize. So I'm gonna talk briefly about SageMaker Ground Truth. As I said before, what you basically get is you get options to either utilize the Mechanical Turk service, in which case you can specify the number of um, contractors who are going to actually annotate your data for you um, on a particular image or video set. So you can specify three, five, 10 
individual contractors to, uh, they will each draw a bounding box or label or do whatever you need them to do. And then what it does give you is it gives you a unified confidence score um, where it takes and collates all of that data for you. And then so you can go through as we've done on an individual basis and say, I only want to accept results above this particular confidence score. And that is just a great um, benchmark for us to kind of, uh, in an automated fashion, ensure that we are receiving good quality data to train our models with. You can also send that to private workforces, which in our case, we've allowed us to specify either our all hands on deck approach, where it's myself and any other students in the lab are able to specify or are able to label sets. And then again, you have the same kind of result of you can collate all of that data, determine which images you want to utilize, or you can go down to an individual person and have a private workforce of one and say, I want you to handle this and I want these other people to handle this. So it gives you a really good amount of granularity of control to um, specify who you want working on what, how many people, and then also to monitor their progress as they go through. So as I said, you can either label whole images as we have in this result here, where all we're doing is we're taking an individual image and we're saying whether the ball is in or out of the net at a particular moment in time. This is from one of our earlier attempts. I'll give a little more specificity on that in a moment. Um, or you can take the same data set or any data set and specify bounding box labeling. And then what Ground Truth provides is an interface with just a simple click and drag um, kind of interaction paradigm where you can have an athlete come in or a student come in and draw all of these bounding boxes for you on an image by image basis. Um, what we've discovered is that it's actually faster and more efficient rather than, as I specified, we have four classes that we want to look at in any given frame of video data. It's actually faster and more efficient if we have an individual student or contractor only do one class for a particular video and then collate all of them together. So we'll have one person only do nets and they can run through it very, very quickly. I have one person only do backboard and then I can programmatically combine all of those together into a single output result and then bring that into uh, recognition custom labels. So you can see here, this is what the interface looks like. Um, it allows for anyone to train custom computer vision models and rapidly utilize them. Um, you do not need any prior experience. Onboarding it has been very, very quick. And those who didn't even consider this as an option for them, particularly students in this context, um, were really excited and interested to both do these projects and learn more about how they could potentially apply them to additional projects. So you can see this interface here. What we're able to do is we're able to import directly from SageMaker Ground Truth. Uh, the results are displayed there. We can collate um, or not collate, uh, but curate um, our results, take out bad ones at this stage if we want. We can correct bad ones in this interface if we want as well and specify uh, with great detail our training or test sets. It will also potentially uh, allow you to automate the selection of your training and test sets. Uh, typically, it will be 80-20. So 80% 80 of your, your set goes to training, 20% goes to your validation test set for you to get your results from your models. So what we use, as I said, is a bounding box model and an in-out labeling model. So you can see here, these are our results from, this is a little bit old at this point, but this is a really good indicator of what recognition is capable of doing for you. So if you look at the top left there, you get an F1 score as well as precision and um, overall recall. These are um, high level indicators of how well your model is actually doing. F1 score is a combined precision versus recall. So the ability to um, precisely generate the data that you're looking for and something that you have not trained it on versus its ability to recall exactly something that you have trained it on correctly. So how well it, it, it broadly speaking generalizes to both new and already seen data. You can see what's particularly interesting to me is how quickly it's trained. So you can um, run the model, not even necessarily overnight, but you can very rapidly iterate and improve on your results by tweaking your test set, uh, pulling out some data, maybe adding some new data in and seeing how that affects your overall score. So these two models are what we um, drove the results that I'm about to show with. 
and you can see both of them are really high performance in the 90 percentile range or better. So what the bounding boxes allows us to do is we bring it down. This is uh, from a different perspective or a different gym, but we're able to recognize, like I said, the four classes of data. This one here also additionally recognizes the bounding box of the person. And then the in out labeling allows us to determine on a frame by frame basis if the ball is actually in the net or not. Now, I showed full frame images like this one previously, but what we actually ended up utilizing as a better result for us is taking the bounding boxes from the first stage, the bounding box model, and then cropping all of the images down just to what it determines to be the bounding box image uh, for the, the basketball. And then we train and test on that. So all of my test set is an image like you see here of just where the basketball is, uh, bring it down to uh, 65 by 65 pixels, which is the smallest image you can pass through to recognition. And then when we actually go through and we analyze data on the back end, we do the same thing. We run bounding boxes first, take all of the data down just to that, and then we run our making this models. And then our final vertical is separate from AWS. It's based off of our own heuristics, but I think it's very exciting. So I also want to show that as well. Um, this is a spreadsheet of all of the phases that we are identifying in the actual movement of the shot based off of post estimator. So to orient you, each pair of columns is what the actual human has coded and said, this is the frame at which uh, the ball is being caught by the, the athlete prior to shooting. This is when the elbow is starting to go up this is when the ball is directly overhead. This is when the elbow is starting to extend as we're beginning to release and then release where the ball is out of hand. And then we also uh, mark start and end of the shot using just some basic heuristics beyond there. And then to orient you, dark green is exact agreement with the human based off of the machine learning output. And then it goes uh, progressively worse from uh, light green to red. Um, the big takeaway here is 85% of all of our events are found within actually 48 milliseconds of what the ground truth is as determined by our um, hand coders. So what's exciting to me, just to see it in practice, is this is some uh, footage of Adam taking some free throws. He does not have a rebounder. So you can see after every shot, what's going to happen is he's going to collect his own rebound and then he's going to come back and set up again and then take the shot. So this is 33 shots. I believe this took uh, six minutes to do. And the big takeaway here is 75 to 80%, if not more, of the video is completely useless from an analysis perspective. And if you're thinking about it in terms of the manual um, analysis paradigm, this is something that a hand coder would have to go through and potentially take a couple hours and find each individual um, shot, mark the start and end, ignore anything else in between, and then only then can you kind of go through and actually do your analysis of looking at gaze, of looking at the various phases of the shot, and that sort of thing. Or using the system we put together now, I can do one button click and we get a result that looks like this, where this is not based off of any human annotated data for this particular video. Um, there was not any additional processing I had to do, but what it's doing is it's taking the video and it chops it down to exactly where we want it to be in terms of the start and end of the shot. So it starts right before Adam does his little um, spin to settle in, and it's meant to end uh, when the ball hits the ground for the first time. So to me, that is incredibly exciting before you even get to the automated analysis portion in that we can take a video and hone in directly to the elements that are actually important for analysis. And then just to prove that it's also generalizable, here is a, uh, another volunteer doing the same task in a completely different gym, completely different person, body type, and it also is able to recognize the phases well enough to crop all the shots. Um, in a way that you would expect, which is very exciting to me. So 
getting back to AWS and how we actually orchestrated this whole automated pipeline that allows us to get these results, um, what we have is we have local data. We have a uh, locally executed data collection tool um, that takes in both the external video camera stream and the Toby glasses data. And what we do once the data collection is done is we uh, immediately have that upload to uh, S3 in a specified data ingestion bucket. That uh, the presence of that data kicks off two parallel uh, events using event bridge um, in order to actually orchestrate the data um, and the individual analysis of each frame as we talked about in the, the longer video and putting on bounding boxes and making this and all that jazz. Um, we utilize SQS and AWS step functions to allow us to um, basically take what would be a local for loop or a for loop inside of a Lambda function and really just separate it out into um, individual uh, tiny units of work, the minimum unit of work, in this case, analyzing a single video or, or a single frame rather than the whole video. That goes out to our custom Lambda function code that then will go out to Amazon recognition and that will run both pose or bounding boxes and make miss. And then in parallel, we also run out to our third party pose estimator. All of that data comes back directly to S3, where we, as a second stage of analysis, we run event bridge again to our phase identifier, which is just um, written in uh, Lambda and Python. And then that all comes back down to S3. And then from S3, we're able to pull it into our local viewer. Um, the viewer itself right now is still um, in progress, and that's probably one of the, the major sticking points for us in terms of our MVP that we are continuously developing and we are looking forward to launching soon. So uh, before I hand it back off to Adam to talk about that kind of stage of uh, business development and how AWS has enabled us to, to get to where we are, I wanted to talk briefly about um, what we've been doing in terms of iteration and improvement. This is not necessarily, I don't want to represent this as the best way to do it. I want to represent this as the way that we found we want to handle things as we um, really transition from a local only lab to a lab where we're putting cloud first, um, which is to say uh, we, when we're de designing a lot of these analysis pipeline steps, orchestration of the pipeline, as I, I showed you in the flowchart uh, just now, really is the last step or was the last step for us. What we really did was we needed to know that each atomic unit of work was functional. Those with QA experience might you know, think of it in terms of a unit test before you go through and you run a smoke test through the whole pipeline. You want to know that these individual pieces work that you can iterate through them, that you can parameterize them correctly. And then what we do is that we then bring them up to AWS, right? Our, a lot of our code um, is now natively written in Python that we can then pull directly up to AWS and run. Um, the only thing that we really needed to do was make sure that we had our dependencies managed in uh, AWS. So we rely a lot on OpenCV. So we need to make sure that OpenCV is available to us. And then otherwise, it's been very um, straightforward and um, largely very successful in scaling our existing scripts directly to the cloud. Now, the biggest lift uh, for anyone, whether it's myself, a student, um, or anyone who's looking to develop a system like this, is data wrangling. Um, you know, you, you have that, that adage of garbage in leads to garbage out. Um, I honestly think this is actually a good thing. Um, the fact that I am spending more time determining what data I want to collect, uh, determining what data I want to keep, annotating that data, and just monitoring the, the health of our database of, of input training data, um, that I'm spending more time with that as a, a researcher and as a developer is, to my mind, nice. It means that I'm spending less time on the things that are um, 
not necessarily within my wheelhouse or my area of core competence as a researcher or as a business and spending most of my time developing the things that I actually care about, which I think has been a huge boon for us as we've gone through with AWS. And the last thing that I want to touch on, and I have two video examples here, is, is automating failure. And this might be something that is difficult for a, a lean lab such as what we are at Starheel. Um, so I'm not talking about like a, a continuous integration, running a suite of tests every you know week or every evening. What I'm really talking about is understanding for us, and I have two great examples here, understanding for us what our points of failure are, what, what a mode of failure looks like, and detecting it right away. And then what we do is we're able to take the frames where we have failed in some way, dump that directly to a folder, and then what we've done in order to develop a more robust recognition model is we take that folder of images and we send it off either to Mechanical Turk or a student and say, hey, these are edge cases where we failed. We need you to look into those edge cases for us and ideally improve the model um, so that we no longer have to handle those edge cases. Or, you know, if the model is performing exactly the way that we want it to, but the heuristics are not, then we start talking about tweaking those parameters or creating fallback conditions, et cetera. So I want to show briefly, this one's a fantastic example. I love this one. This is something you don't know where you don't, what you don't know, right? So uh, we collected a bunch of data on students, on ourselves, and then we came in and we wanted a little bit more high resolution external data. Um, and so we had Ben here volunteer and our model at the time uh, couldn't handle all the athletes, which I think, you know, as you talk about professional basketball is critical. But you didn't, until we had that data in the data set, um, we didn't know what we didn't know. And so we went back and we immediately said, okay, cool. Well, thank you, Ben. This gives us something that we can correct and improve the model on, which I think is, is pretty funny. And then um, what I want to do here is see if I can't stop this at a particular frame. Sorry, the playback might not be super great. I'm going to bring it up to here and see if I can't just catch it with my mouse bring it to the right spot. So when I talked about the phase recognition and I showed you the chart, the color-coded chart, green and red, of all of the phases that we're able to detect correctly, right? The most of the red was concentrated at the very beginning of the shot, where we're trying to determine the phase where they have collected the ball and they are ready to actually um, begin the shot. And so we base that off of this metric of when the ball is in hand, based off of the conjunction of the pose estimation and where the, the bounding box of the ball is. So you can see that in blue. And so what we discovered is that the source of that red, the source of that error for that particular trial was because at a particular point, and I had it there, I'm just gonna scroll through, the bounding box goes away for one frame. And in this particular frame, see that right there? In that particular frame, it goes away. And so our heuristic of, is the ball in hand anymore? goes to false, and then all of a sudden, all of your, you have this cascade of all of those red um, designs or red demarcation of phases. Um, so that's been you know, subsequently fixed, but that's based off of, well, we can do two steps. We can improve the model, so we can take the images where um, it failed, and we can throw that into AWS recognition, rapidly improve the model, and we can also take our heuristics and parameterize them so you go, well, what do you do if you're missing a frame? Well, we can interpolate for a frame. How big of a window do we want that to be, et cetera? And then you can really start dialing into the source of the issue there. But what I want to specify is that both of these are actually the same problem, which is we have more or less, more or fewer basketballs in the scene than what we actually wanted to have. And so what we can do is without a human ever touching it, we can get our results back, and the moment we say, oh, we actually have two balls in the scene, we dump that off into a separate folder, that separate folder gets uploaded to Ground Truth, and then we can go through and say, is this something that we can improve the model on with our students? Boom, 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 boom. And then that's a very simple and accessible way for somebody who doesn't have a big um, production team or a big QA team to automate these sources of failure catch these edge cases, and then to be able to address them. 
So I'm very excited about the state of uh, the system. Hopefully that was interesting to everyone. I'm very excited about where the system's about to go. And in order to discuss that a little bit further, I'm gonna hand it off back to Adam to talk about our commercialization pipeline. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, one of the things I wanna talk about briefly, I'm gonna kind of pull us back out to a higher level view, is the innovation that's going on here at UNC Chapel Hill and the forward thinking nature of um, our, our digital related technology transfer to commercialization. So UNC has been incredibly supportive um, in helping us move this research from an academic research lab out to um, our startup company, um, Ellipsis. And so I just wanna share with you sort of what the process has been and how AWS has really accelerated this timeline. So we, we put in our provisional patent back in December of 2020. We began some customer discovery processes. Um, we began some basketball research and development. What that really means is we put in an IRB so that we were approved to collect data and we began collecting data. However, it wasn't until about a year ago that we actually started partnering with AWS on this particular problem. So you can see our AWS adoption there in Q3 of 2021. Uh, this is also when we formed our startup company, but we really um, were in a race to get this platform off the ground. And had AWS not become a viable partner, um, I'm, I know we would not have made it um, across the finish line. So, um, really, it's been a calendar year since we started working on this problem until we're presenting to you today. We have an MVP, our minimum viable product that's scheduled for completion in the next couple of weeks. We, um, it helped us receive some non-dilutive uh, funding from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and we've already started talking with professional um, basketball teams um, to discuss initial service contracts. So um, we are moving forward with seed fundraising in the next couple of months here um, as we start to demonstrate some traction with some of these um, potential early adopters. And we're a software as a service company, um, but we've been able to really accelerate our ability to become more automated and sort of start to chip away at the service part of that so that um, it's more cost effective and our margins are better. Um, in these initial service contracts. So again, um, none of this would have been possible, I think, had we tried to build the system on our own. Um, certainly we would not have gotten the um, contribution from the students uh, that we needed, and it, it enabled us to um, move quickly and to problem solve quickly, um, which as Ryan shared is, is really important as we're moving forward and accelerating the timelines on some of these things. So, I started talking a bit about our lean academic research environment, and I want to spend the last maybe two minutes here just talking about what our new environment looks like. So in the last year, we've done a lot of self-reflecting. Um, we've learned more and more about what um, moving to the public cloud and AWS can do for us, and we're thinking strategically now long-term about not just tech transfer, but also just general research projects, federal funding, and that sort of thing. And what you see here is a portion of a schematic that um, our, one of our collaborators at AWS helped build out. And, and the idea is that um, they're with us every step of the way and we can accelerate to sort of the, the proof of concept, which is that puzzle piece there at step two, um, very quickly. Uh, you can see we have um, technology readiness level bars down at the bottom for those of you who understand sort of defense research and government um, research for, for tech development. Um, it, it gets us to that TRL4, early TRL5 stage much more quickly. Um, it allows us to engage with stakeholders faster. Uh, we can perform customer discovery with components of our system already in place. We can get data more efficiently um, and also, in, like I said, engage with students um, more efficiently and sort of more comprehensively. To give you an example, um, a year ago in the fall, we were still sort of in a hybrid learning environment. Not all classes were back to in-person, which meant not all research labs were fully in-person. We still had students that needed to get research experience and wanted to get research experience. What AWS enabled us to do was we didn't need these students to be on-site in the lab. They could be at home on their couch watching Netflix while also doing hand coding to help us train our models. They got data science experience, also with no previous data science background, 
and were able to be part of the research process. And they could then, when they could come in, they could see how we were implementing it. Um, they helped us with the in-person data collections when those were available uh, and so on and so forth. So it really gave students who normally wouldn't have had an opportunity to be involved in a project like this, um, full hands-on experience. And they've now been able to move on and, and do more sort of tech focused things with our lab and other labs in the department. And then ultimately what it allows us to do is build a foundational platform that is completely scalable and is more cost effective than bringing on a, a larger sort of data science team. Instead of having um, like, let's say a single biostatistician or a single data scientist and them having to commit, you know, a third of their time to the project, they can now um, spread themselves across more projects. In fact, Ryan has done this with his own management and um, they just have to sort of manage uh, the deployment of the services rather than building out the entire ecosystem. So it allows these folks to be more efficient and to have their hands on more projects so that they can have more impact on a broader range of um, research areas. So that sort of concludes um, the presentation portion of the webinar. Our contact information is here if you have um, specific questions. Um, you know, shameless self-promotion, I urge you to follow us on Twitter. Um, we're always um, getting ready to post the, the next wave of technologies that we're developing and helping to support the UNC um, digital text transfer ecosystem. So, thank you. Thank you, Adam and Ryan, for sharing your research. That was really fascinating. I know we're close on time, but we do have time for one question. Uh, I have notated any questions that have come in, and we will certainly follow up accordingly. And that first question is, um, can you explain a little bit about how you used AWS to lower the barrier of entry and empower non-technical students? You spoke about it a little bit, but maybe you could expand some. Sure, I'll start. And then I think um, Ryan's been more involved with hands-on with the students. Um, what it's enabled us to do is to cast a wider net for potential research assistants. So again, students who wouldn't have normally had the opportunity to contribute to our research mission are able to engage with research, which is a, a big focus of, of UNC Chapel Hill. Um, it's enabled us, we had one student who unfortunately was injured um, in a club sport and was not even able to get to campus and into the lab, and she was still able to maintain for her um, research assistant hours um, by staying home and, and working on these things. We've also been able to incorporate uh, student athletes into the lab, which has been very difficult you can imagine their training schedules, they don't usually have a lot of time to be in the lab actually working hands-on. But what this allows them to do is to be in the lab when they can, but when they can't, if they're traveling, um, if they're just, you know, um, they don't have a lot of time between classes and, and practice or competition, they're still able to contribute within the ecosystem um, that's enabled by AWS. So, and then Ryan, I don't know if you want to share anything specific. Yeah. I, it's very interesting that we get, even in EXSS, so um, you get a very wide range of technical ability, right? Um, I say that because I started as computer science before moving to EXSS, and so now we, we are getting people who are going either that route or potentially want to kind of start in EXSS and go computer science. Um, so we're able to get people in at every stage of the pipeline. We've had people go, well, I want to train this model. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. We had somebody um, recently who was here with us for the summer who was here for a particular project and said, oh, I think I could use AWS to do a completely different running project with eye tracking. And I was like, okay, off and run with it. Go ahead. Right. And that allowed them to um, pursue something that I don't think they would even think they'd have the expertise or the ability necessarily to do as an undergrad, because what we're able to do is we say, okay, well, we have this tool set. I, I understand this tool set. I have this base of code that we're able to utilize very rapidly. Um, and it's allowed them to ideate on their own projects. Uh, back to basketball, we've had people who have gone, oh, well, maybe it's a good idea to go get a bunch of scans of a bunch of basketball uh, courts. And then they'll go off and do that. And they have no technical training or programming skill, but they can go from, I have an idea, let's do this, to, okay, it's annotated, let's train the model, okay, let's use it um, without even having to touch code. So it's a very, um, you, you can be as low code as, I, as you want as a student, 
And that's really enabled us to, as Adam say, said, cast a really wide net and take kind of all comers who are interested, including the, the student athlete that I think you're referring to actually said at the end of his, his semester with us that he wanted to learn more about computer science and what he can do with that, um, which I just thought was, as somebody who's into that, I, I think that's where the discipline needs to go, is that, that kind of um, nexus of computer science, data science, and exercise science. And if we can get more students um, who don't either feel comfortable or don't feel like they fit that mold, to be able to actually do applications with it without having to write code, I think that's a, a net positive for the entire field. Yes, thank you. Thank you both so much for sharing your time and your expertise. Um, I also want to thank each of you that took time on the call today uh, to join us for participating. If you have any questions about any of our upcoming sessions or if you wish to access prior recordings, you can follow the link that is on your screen right now, and I've also placed it in the chat. Um, before you leave, if you could please take a moment to give us some feedback on today's session. A short survey will pop up on the screen as we close out. Um, we host these research for uh, these webinars for the research community. So any feedback that you have is valuable and will help us to continue to deliver content uh, that the research community cares about. Thank you again, both Adam and Ryan, for sharing your expertise. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon for another research seminar series. Goodbye, everyone.